Okay, we're going to talk about do the brain and the heart get microvascular disease, microvascular atherosclerosis and vasospasm. And what's happening here is the brain can teach us something about the heart. They're, they're not exactly the same, but there's enough parallels that it's worth talking about. This is the arterial anatomy of the brain. It's called the circle of Willis, named after the anatomist Willis who discovered it. And basically, it almost looks like a little person. These are almost like the eyes of the internal carotid artery coming up into the brain. Then the internal carotid artery splits into the middle cerebral artery, MCA, and the anterior cerebral artery, ACA. Okay, then there's the posterior cerebral artery, the PCA. All right, and the, the key point is that these arteries are on the outside of the brain. You know, like if, if my, my microphone was the brain, the arteries are all outside of it. Okay, then there's little tiny penetrating brain branches that go into the parenchyma of the brain. Oh, by the way, too, I'm going to show you one other thing about these arteries is um, the reason why we care about the names of the arteries is that we have to describe disease in them, atherosclerotic narrowing, stenosis, or aneurysm. So this is the anterior communicating artery. So this would be an anterior communicating artery aneurysm, an ACOM aneurysm. If I had an aneurysm in the middle cerebral artery, we call it MCA, that'd be an MCA aneurysm M1 segment, the first segment. So we're not going to go into all that. You don't need to know any of that, but I'm explaining to you that's why the terminology is valuable so you can price, precisely describe disease. Okay. Now here is a picture of the anatomy with the brain drawn in there. So this is the same set of vessels. We're at the base of the brain, and this is the circle of Willis arterial anatomy. So here's the internal carotid artery. It comes up into the brain, bifurcates into the middle cerebral artery. This is the M1 segment, the M2 segment. Here's the anterior cerebral artery, the A1 segment, anterior communicating artery, ACOM, and here's the A2 uh, anterior cerebral artery, second segment. Okay, so anyways, the point is, here's the basic anatomy. It's all on the outside of the brain. That's what you need to know, because that's how it's going to associate with the heart. Okay, now here is an MRA, magnetic resonance arteriogram. I look at these every day. Okay, so this is everything superimposed on itself. The formal medical term for this would be a submental vertex view. So what you can make out of this is the internal carotid artery, ICA, comes up into the brain, bifurcates into the MCA. MCA is bigger than the ACA, anterior cerebral artery, then it forms the A2, uh, the ACA. A little ACOM is sort of hidden in there. Uh, here's the PCA, posterior cerebral artery. There's a posterior communicating artery, PCOM. But the bottom line is you got these big arteries on the outer surface. That's the key point, big arteries on the outer surface. Okay, now here's a brain MRI, uh, both normal and abnormal. So this right here is a normal brain MRI. You can see the cerebral ventricles, which contain cerebral spinal fluid. These are the lateral ventricles, the frontal horn, posterior horn. Uh, they're very small in diameter. And the brain is what I call a young brain, a tight brain, and it's up against the inner table of the skull. This brain right here is an older atrophic brain, and the sulci are bigger. And you can see there's cerebral spinal fluid easily visible between the inner table of the skull and the brain parenchyma, the cortical sulci. Cortex means bark like the bark of the tree, the outer surface of the brain. Okay, now you can see the cerebral ventricles here are quite large compared to the normal brain. That's because there's atrophy, central atrophy of the adjacent brain tissue, the adjacent brain parenchyma. All these white spots are abnormal. Those are damaged brain. Sometimes it's called gliosis or scarring. And the way this, this is a flare sequence, which basically means like a T2 sequence, high signal fluid with suppression of the cerebral spinal fluid such that the cerebral spinal fluid is dark, but all the abnormal edema within the brain tissue is bright, high signal. It looks like white paint. Okay, so this is totally normal. There's no white paint around the ventricles, and this is very abnormal, okay? Most patients uh, with this extensive of uh, periventricular white matter disease would be cognitively impaired. Sometimes they're not. They're just slow, but they're not formally, frankly, cognitively impaired. But, you know, you wouldn't want them to be your, uh, your strategic partner, let's put it that way. Okay, so anyways... Uh, a lot of periventricular flare hyperintensity is consistent with extensive small vessel cerebrovascular atherosclerotic ischemic disease. And there's more than just atherosclerosis. It could be overtreated hypertension, etc. Okay, but anyways, all these white spots are abnormal, and the small vessels are causing this. You could have totally normal large arteries on the outer surface of the brain and just have disease of the small vessels and end up with this pattern. And that's what's going to be relevant to the heart, which I'm going to show now. Okay, here's the arteries of the heart. And what I want to make a point about is 
the arteries everybody always talks about are the outer surface arteries of the heart. They're called the epicardial coronary arteries. Imagine this was the heart, this, this red shirt all bundled up. Okay, I'm gonna put my fingers on it, just three fingers. All right, I'll actually put these three fingers. All right, so imagine that the, my thumb would be the right coronary artery. That goes to the right side of the heart. And then these two, arter these two fingers right here, there'll be a left anterior descending and there'll be a circumflex artery. All right, and they supply the left side of the heart predominantly. And so the point I'm making is these big arteries on the outer surface of the heart are the epicardial coronaries. Those are the only ones that are well seen during a cardiac cath, coronary arteriogram. And those are the only ones you can put a stent in, especially proximally, and they're the only ones you can do a surgical bypass on. That's a very important point. You can only treat the big arteries on the outside of the heart. But there's a lot of additional arteries in the heart. There's all these small penetrating arteries, the intramuscular branches, you could call them, because they go into the heart muscle. Myocardium is like heart muscle, so you can call them intramyocardial branches. They're also called the microvasculature. And so what I'm trying to establish here is that there's a similar pattern of arterial anatomy, meaning that the major known vessels that everybody talks about are the big vessels on the outer surface, outer surface of the brain or outer surface of the heart. And those are the only ones reachable by stenting. It's a lot easier to stent proximal coronaries than it is to stent intracranial arteries. But once again, you can pretty much only intervene with a catheter, balloon, and a stent in large arteries. Okay, once they get smaller, you just can't do it. You can't fit the stent in there. You can't fit the balloon in there. Okay, this is going to have a lot of relevance in a moment. That's what I'm working towards here. Okay, this is a guy, Baxter uh, Montgomery. He's a well-known cardiologist who wrote some really nice papers recently about successfully uh, reversing congestive heart failure with a plant-based diet, with a vegan diet. Okay, here's a cardiac cath on one of his patients, and you can see there's some narrowing of this coronary artery right here, the left main, and then after the, the vegan diet, the stenosis, the narrowing resolved. So that's resolution of a coronary artery stenosis, probably a soft plaque, if you will, of atherosclerosis after a vegan diet. All right, so that's wonderful to have reversed one of these epicardial coronaries with a vegan diet. All right, but that's what a cardiac cath looks like on the outer surface of those heart. All right, now what I'm going to show you is a little bit more fancy stuff, but it's interesting. So here's the paper, microvascular disease, small vessel disease of the brain and the heart a shared pathogenesis. So this author is pointing out that there's very similar risk factors, you know, all the usual suspects, atherosclerosis uh, related to, you know, diabetes, hypertension, high blood lipids, hyperlipidemia, obesity, smoking tobacco, okay, high fat diets. All right, so uh, what he says is this is a cause obviously in the brain of much dementia. Yeah, we've talked about that before. But what the author is basically saying here is that microvascular dysfunction of the heart tends to go with microvascular disease of the brain. They seem to share a common uh, pathophysiologic mechanism. Now, I got this picture here that's kind of small. I'm going to explain the picture, but in a moment, I'll show you the same picture in large so it'll be easier to understand. So first of all, here is a normal heart. In a normal heart, they initially do provocative adenosine testing. Adenosine is a vasodilator, and it also speeds up cardiac contraction, speeds up the heart rate. So when you speed up the heart rate and you dilate the coronaries, you get increased blood flow. At rest, this is a coronary in a cross section, like a short axis view, looks like a circle. So at rest, you got blue. Uh, perfusion of the coronaries. You don't need that much blood going into the muscular branches of the heart because the heart muscle is not that active. But when the heart muscle becomes hyperactive because of the adenosine, this upper row of films here, so the row A, here's the row B, um, now you've got adenosine on board and now the heart looks yellow to orange. It's taking up a lot more blood flow. The color schema lets you quantify the amount of blood flow. So the, here's the key point. In a normal heart, when you vasodilate the arteries and you speed up the heart rate, you get a lot more blood entering into the intramyocardial branches. Okay, so they're all yellow to orange. That's the key point. Now here's an abnormal heart. And this patient had a normal cardiac cath, so they don't have epicardial coronary artery disease. This means the, the big arteries on the outer surface of the heart were totally normal. But in this patient, when they gave the adenosine, they, they don't get this frank uh, coloration of becoming like yellow and orange. As a matter of fact, in the, in the inner parts of the heart, the inner layer of the heart wall is called the endocardium. The middle parts, the myocardium, the outer surface is the epicardium. 
So just beneath the endocardial layer, so this is called subendocardial, you've got blue, persistent low flow. And now the arteries penetrate from the outer surface of the heart, from the epicardium, and what they're saying is they just can't adequately reach the subendocardial um, area. So you've got subendocardial, uh, poor blood supply, poor blood perfusion, and that's indicative of microvascular angina. It's microvascular angina because the cardiac cath was normal. The epicardial arteries are clean. You see when you're in a low flow state with no adenosine on board, no vasodilator, uh, tachycardia inducing drug on board, you got a normal blue um, myocardium. It's all blue how it should be, just like it was up here in the normal patient. Okay, this is a symptomatic patient, and I'm also showing you, I'll show you better on the magnified view on the next image, but you got a lot of uh, periventricular uh, hyperintensity from small vessel disease. So here, let me show you the next picture. It'll be better. I just had to explain it with that picture. Okay, so here we are in the next picture, and what you can see now is, here, I'll, I'll come back over here, is you can see that, again, normal heart, blue at rest, blue at rest. Okay, this is an MRI, again, a cross-sectional short access view, cutting the heart in half. So it would be like as if this was a heart, you just sort of chopped it like this, and now you're looking at the muscle and FOSS. Okay, and so what you can see here is normal at rest in our patient who's having uh, cardiac symptoms, but when they give the adenosine, the vasodilator, so the heart rate speeds up, instead of getting this sort of beautiful yellow and orange hyperperfusion picture, you still are blue in the subendocardial space, meaning here's the endocardium, the part that touches the cardiac central chamber, the lumen of the left ventricle, and just subendocardial, it stays blue. It's not getting enough blood. And the point was that is small vessel disease because the cardiac cath of the epicardial arteries was wide open. Um, and the same patient has um, hyperintensity in the periventricular regions. This is a T2-weighted sequence, meaning that the cerebral spinal fluid was not suppressed. That's why it's a little bit difficult, more difficult to look at. I preferred on the previous brain MRI, you had a flare sequence where you had cerebral spinal fluid suppression such that you can see accentuated the periventricular flare hyperintensities. In this one, on a T2 sequence, without suppressing the signal of the CSF, in a sense, it's like squinting into the sun. So, you know, hyperintensity adjacent to hyperintensity is more difficult to, it's less conspicuous to, um, to show it. But you do have periventricular hyperintensities here, 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 and here as well. So this patient has small vessel disease. So the point of this, why did I show this? You've got small vessel disease in the brain. You've got small vessel disease in the heart, microvascular angina. The two go together. Now, small vessel disease is more of a problem in the brain than it is in the heart, but we can see it more easily in the brain than in the heart. But the point of this, why am I going through all this? Because what I'm trying to tell you is it's fantasy land to think you can fix these problems with coronary artery bypass surgery. You can only bypass the big vessels. You can only stent the big vessels. You can't treat the microvasculature, which is diffuse throughout the brain, throughout the heart, except by diet. And you can also try treating it with pills, but pills have tons of side effects and problems. So what I'm really saying is you either get your act together with a diet or you're screwed because you're going to plug up these small arteries. That was kind of the, the, the big point I was trying to get. And another point of this artery, here's a similar article. <clears throat> what it's shown here is that um, underlying causes of anginal chest pain may be due to small vessel disease in about one out of three patients. That's a lot of patients. And ischemic heart disease, because the small vessel disease associates with vascular risk factors. So the usual vascular risk factors, it's actually more common in women than um, one would expect. Um, and hypertension, of course. The vascular anatomy of the heart and the brain is similar with conduit arteries distributed on the outer surface. And then tissue perfusion is achieved through deep penetrating arteries. You know, we talked about the penetrating arteries of the brain. We talked about the intramyocardial branches um, of the heart. Um, and then they talk about uh, microvascular angina in the heart. It's also called syndrome X. But the other point about this is this microvascular disease can cause atrial fibrillation. This microvascular disease can cause angina, chest pain on exertion. This microvascular disease can cause congestive heart failure. And leaky gut can cause this. I've talked about amyloid clotting as being a mechanism to cause this. High-fat diets, rouleau formation, they can cause this. Being overloaded with iron, having a high serum ferritin and having free iron in the blood causing ferrous redox cycling can lead to the same effect, basically, as leaky gut and postprandial endotoxemia causing hypercoagulability. Anything that makes those red blood cells stick together is going to predispose to this. And microvascular disease is a major player in destroying the kidneys, like in uh, diabetic uh, 
nephropathy, okay, ischemic nephropathy of the kidneys. I see this all day long every day. This stuff is super common. We talked about small vessel disease in the brain. It also occurs in the eye, you know, microvascular disease in the retina, diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, okay, and it occurs in the heart. So I realize I went into some kind of fancy high-tech stuff there. Uh, oh, here's another case. I just want to show you this uh, right here. This patient, what they did is instead of using the adenosine vasodilator like I showed on the cardiac MRI test, in this case they used acetylcholine as a vasoconstrictor. And these patients both had, this is a patient A over here, and here's patient B. Patient B, patient A. So they both had normal cardiac cath at rest. So their epicardial coronary arteries are wide open. But now they infused a vasoconstrictor, acetylcholine vasoconstrictor. It does the opposite of the adenosine, which opened up the artery. This is a vasoconstrictor which closes down the arteries. And when they injected that to close down the microvasculature, blood flow stopped in the uh, left anterior descending artery. You got a normal looking left anterior descending artery. There's no stenosis there, but blood flow shut down because there was nowhere for that blood to go. There were the, the intramyocardial branches were shut down. Okay, and then the same patient who's got, micro, and that's a hyperreactive response to vasoconstrictor acetylcholine, and the same patient has microvascular disease in the brain. Actually, they had a, um, a left occipital lobe, posterior left temporal lobe stroke here. You can see how there's abnormal flare hyperintensity on the left side, but not on the right side. You can always tell this is right side, this is left, because it's as if the patient's feet were pointing towards you. Um, and then here's another patient with the same situation. Normal looking cardiac cath, they had a normal cardiac cath at rest, but upon infusion of vasoconstrictor or acetylcholine, you can see a shutdown of the microvasculature. Notice how, like on this patient, when you gave, a, when you, when you gave acetylcholine, you don't see any of these small uh, branches coming off, but you see, you see them quite well when there's no acetylcholine on board. Same thing over here. You shut down the microvasculature and you diminish flow in the large vessels, the epicardial branches. And the same patient has extensive microvascular disease, dilated ventricles because of central atrophy, loss of brain parenchyma centrally, and then all this periventricular hyperintensity. And again, this is a flare sequence. You can tell because the cerebral spinal fluid is suppressed. It's like a T2 with uh, CSF suppression. It is suppressed, but you got a lot of periventricular hyperintensity. You got a small stroke here in the right parietal lobe, little tiny strokes in the, the left frontal lobe, more extensive stroke in the right frontal lobe. So the point of all this was microvascular disease in the heart goes hand in hand with microvascular disease in the brain. And the only way you're going to prevent this stuff is by optimizing your cardiovascular risk factors, uh, which is most importantly optimizing your diet. Low fat, low sodium, 100% vegan diet with no oils and no smoking tobacco, no drinking alcohol. Um, and I would recommend, you know, going full board on the Esselstyn diet. You know, the, 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 the green six times a day for Esselstyn, that's for high risk patients, but for everybody, I would do the other stuff. So um, anyways, I hope that was interesting. And, and the whole point again was both structures, the heart and the brain have these external vessels on the outer surface that are approachable with stents, okay, and potentially with surgery, especially in the heart, but they are not approachable, the inner penetrating arteries by any mechanism other than drugs or diet. And the smart move is to optimize the diet. Otherwise you just trash them progressively and you end up stupid in the brain or you end up with AFib or CHF in the heart. So I know I went into a lot of stuff, but I thought that was interesting. So hopefully you found it helpful.